to the Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The topic of today's presentation is the latest advances in TAVR, how to significantly reduce conduction disturbances. I'm your host, my name is Van Rekrezer, clinical professor of medicine and cardiology at Baylor College of Medicine and international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. It's a special pleasure today to have a special guest, uh, Dr. Hemal Gada. He's the president of Heart and Vascular Institute and medical director of Structural Heart Program and staff international cardiologist at UPMC Pinnacle in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Dr. Gada. Thank you, Dr. Crazier. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome. Here are our disclosures. I have no disclosure related to this particular presentation, and Dr. God also states that he has no conflict of interest pertinent to this presentation. So, uh, as we know, significant progress has been made for the last decade and more in TARVR related to incidents of many complications that can occur during TARVR, and this includes vascular complications, incident of stroke, annular rupture, and a variety of wire perforations such as pericardial or atrial or tamponade, and also need for the pacemaker. As we can see here from this information published in circulation in 2017, related to the 30-day permanent pacemaker implantation rates, that they vary significantly between different devices, but also from different studies. But uh, needless to say, the incidence and the need for pacemaker implantation could be all the way up to 37% from several studies, which is prohibitively high. So uh, conduction disturbances that occur post-TAVR and the need for permanent pacemaker implantation depend on many factors and many variables. And some of them are listed here such as type of conduction disturbances that occur during TAVR or conduction disturbances that are present prior mm -hmm. to TAVR. Also, baseline comorbidities can drive uh, this uh, need for permanent pacing implantation. And also, whether the patient is uh, planned to be discharged early from the hospital. Also, there are several socioeconomic factors that play a role, as well as need for extended uh, cardiac monitoring that might not be available to a certain subset of patients. So all of those factors uh, influence our decision as far as the need for pacemaker implantation. So Dr. Gada, you presented at uh, TCT in 2019 data from the Evolute low risk trial related to permanent pacemaker implantation. And, uh, some very meaningful and important information uh, was presented related to this particular problem. Can you discuss this a little bit more in detail? What were the findings uh, and what have, have we learned about the need for pacemaker implantation with this particular study? What we found in the Medtronic low risk trial is that Evolute had a pacemaker rate at 30 days, an effective pacemaker rate with transcatheter aortic valve replacement of 17.4% in a low-risk population, and that is just not acceptable. Uh, but really, the truth is in the weeds a little bit because it's not a very uh, solid 17.4%. So what you have here is a site variability funnel plot, basically looking at the centers that implanted in the Evolute low-risk trial, implanted TAVRs. And on the x-axis here, you have an effective permanent pacemaker rate. On, I'm sorry, on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have the number of implanted TAVR patients. Each dot is representative of a single site. And just like all funnel plots, basically you have two confidence intervals that are represented uh, by these uh, dotted lines. And so the red line would be out of the bounds then of two confidence intervals. And the solid black line is indicative of that mean rate of 17.4%. If you look at the bottom right corner of the plot, you'll see my site there. We were the highest enroller in the Evolute low risk trial. Uh, we enrolled about 128 of the roughly 1,000 patients uh, that were inserted into that study. And so we were representing greater than 10% of the clinical trial population. 
Um, out of those patients, 65 randomized to transcatheter aortic valve replacement. None of those patients had pacemakers coming into the procedure. And we ended up with an effective pacemaker rate of somewhere around 1.5%. And so you can see that kind of dot there. And, and we're gonna talk more about implantation technique, but I think what made our site singular, uh, and if you look at the bubble plots, really the entry level of right bundles, pre or post dilation, we were effectively putting the same patient on the table as everyone else was, the same procedural characteristics. It's just that we were using the cusp overlap technique that we'll go over and we use that in every single patient we implanted this valve in. Thank you. So there is a, obviously tremendous variability between centers and uh, the operators that was totally surprising to me when I saw this, knowing that all of those operators were experienced operators and they had plenty of opportunity to pass the learning curve. So obviously it's not just expertise, but a particular technique that plays a significant role as far as incidence of heart block is concerned and need for permanent pacemaker. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a very good statement. Tell us a little bit more about your personal experiences related to the need for permanent pacemaker, uh, both thyroid is concerned, and how did you get to this point of uh, having such a low rate of uh, need for a permanent pacemaker, particularly when you look at some other experience centers that have significantly higher incidence? We've always been a high enroller in the Medtronic studies. Uh, and like this shows, we were the highest enroller in the Medtronic low risk trial, 65 patients randomized to TAVR. Uh, what we found uh, in all of our studies is that you know our clinical performance is related very heavily to pacemaker rate. And we know that from a variety of different studies that have been done on both the immediate and long-term impact of having a permanent pacemaker after transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Our electrophysiologists are by the book. Uh, we don't have any same day permanent pacemaker uh, implantations. They will want to observe the patient over a 24, 48 hour period of time to watch for return of conduction. And so from a hospital efficiency standpoint and really the underpinnings of the economics of our program, uh, it would behoove us to really move towards a strategy where we could reduce the rate of permanent pacemaker implantation. And so anatomically, this is feasible with the technique that we're about to discuss. But if you look at the anatomy in the right way, fluoroscopically, as well as institute some procedural nuances, you also can get very low single digit pacemaker rates. And with the Evolute platform, there's no foreshortening from the ventricular side. And so that's the reason why uh, this is really our main TAVR platform. We've been able to get these pacemaker rates. And of course, we have the hemodynamics related to the superannular uh, valve placement. And so here we have a mean length of stay in the low risk trial of under a day and a half with 90% of our patients discharged home the very next procedural day. You can see our hard outcomes there and they were quite good for this trial. Which is truly remarkable because we know with, with this particular uh, TAVR device in, in very early experiences uh, and early trials, the hospital length of stay was significantly lower, I mean, significantly higher because of the concern for right. the complete heart block. So obviously you have achieved uh, something that's remarkable from the point of view as far as need of the pacemaker concern, but also low uh, incidence of mortality and need for a pacemaker at the later stage. Now, it's interesting from the data that is available from many studies that close to 40% of patients that develop heart block at the time during the procedure or shortly after actually will not necessarily maintain a complete heart block after that. So it means that we are maybe implanting pacemakers uh, more than we need to, but the issue is how long do you keep the patient and when, you, when is it safe to discharge the patient? So that certainly is of concern as well. But uh, let, let's talk about uh, another very uh, important and uh, pertinent information. And uh, let's discuss cardiac anatomy and factors influencing cardiac conduction system disturbances during TAVR. And uh, uh, if you don't mind explaining a little bit uh, this atomy, anatomy that's so important as far as uh, conduction disturbances are concerned that occur during TAVR. Yeah, it's extraordinarily important to understand this anatomy as we set up the TAVR procedure. 
And so what we know about the conduction system is the AV node is really on the right atrial slash ventricular side of the heart. And um, basically then you get a permeation of fibers uh, through the intraventricular septum and they're housed in the membranous septum in the Hispericon G system to a variable degree of length. There was that seminal paper that came out from NYU just a couple of years ago, looking at membranous septum length and its uh, mitigation or enhancement of conduction disturbances based on the length of the actual uh, membranous septum. And so the membranous septum basically houses these fibers that then become very superficial below the membranous septum as you go towards the muscular septum. Uh, the non-coronary cusp is the most inferiorly oriented cusp. And so when we're planning our TAVR procedure, it would be good to have a reference to the non-coronary cusp i.e. a pigtail at the base of the non-coronary cusp, which is great. But equally important is understanding that conduction system, which is really below the non-right commissure. So when we set up a view and we set up an implantation technique, we're going to want to see the non-right commissure in the center of the screen. And so this is the anatomic relevance of what we're about to discuss. Similarly, as we're planning our procedure, we're going to be looking at calcium burden. And the calcium that makes me nervous with regards to self-expanding valves is coronary cusp calcium on the left coronary cusp, because the left coronary cusp is basically opposite the non-right commissure. And so it's going to give you augmented or unopposed radio force if you don't prep left coronary cusp calcification that's significant. And so I think that the anatomy is crucially important in setting up our procedure to avoid conduction disturbances. So maybe you can just briefly mention, you did mention membrane septum as a, one of the important uh, factors as far as conduction system is concerned. Uh, and this is clear from this uh, particular schematic uh, drawing on the anatomy that uh, it is in close proximity to the conduction system. So does the length of the membrane septum have any importance in predicting where you should place the valve and what is the risk of a conduction system problems occurring? after TAVR? We look at the NYU article and at least the procedure that they used to measure membranous septum length and then how they were assessing their depth of the valve deployment. Unfortunately, they had no like core lab CT data that would have given you really what you needed in order to really ascertain whether membranous septum length uh, was prognostic of conduction disturbance. This is what we know and intuitively it would make sense that if you have a, sh a shorter membranous septum versus having a longer one, that your conduction disturbance rates are gonna be quite disparate, meaning you're gonna have a higher rate of conduction disturbances with short membranous septum lengths. That being said, if you implant the valve routinely at two to three millimeters below the annular plane, most membranous septum lengths are gonna be well you know, beyond that range. And so yes, we're all still going to get some conduction disturbances, but shallower deployments referencing the non-right commissure, that's really the key focus here. And so I really don't measure membranous septum length. I don't find much clinical utility in it, but uh, it is something that people are doing and referencing when they're deploying valves. That's very interesting and important. So uh, how does this information relate to the CTA and angiographic imaging during TAVR? How can you correlate pre-procedural uh, imaging with uh, TAVR imaging or or angiographic imaging, and how much does it help you in deciding where to place the valve? So what you see here is our traditional coplanar view that we were all taught to use very early on in TAVR days. And basically here we have non-right left equidistant coplanar. It's our traditional coplanar view that we were taught to deploy uh, basically the sapien prosthesis in, but even with core valve and evolute platforms, the mainstay of gold standard teaching started with this view. But this view is an anatomic fallacy. All three of these cusps insert in differentially along the left ventricular aplo tract. We had talked about the non-coronary cusp being the most inferiorly oriented cusp. Here, not only is the non-coronary cusp not isolated, but you actually are overlapping the non-coronary cusp with the right, leading to a complete uh, confounding of your assessment of the non-right commissure. So in this particular view, you're not really going to understand where you're deploying a valve relative to the conduction system. The other thing about Evolute is that when you're actually going and deploying that valve, you want to remove parallax out of things, parallax out of a marker band, parallax out of a valve platform. When you do all of that, you actually rotate out of the coplanar view. And so really, you're then putting parallax into the native annulus. 
And that really is going to confuse your depth assessment as well. And so if you don't go in with strategy that is isolating the non-coronary cusp, overlapping the left and right, uh, you're really putting yourself at a hindrance of, of, of not being able to understand where exactly you're deploying your valve, especially in relation to the conduction system. Very good. So it's important to know that the annulus is not a straight structure, but it has more like a sphenoid type of a configuration. And it's, uh, like you said, very confusing and actually uh, not helping at all to draw a straight line, assuming that this is where the annulus is. Correct. Now, so this gives you, you an example a... of parallax. Yeah. So here we have a traditional sapien deployment. Uh, so non right left equidistant and coplanar pigtail at the base of the right coronary cusp, middle marker of the sapien just above the base of the pigtail. And now we're de deploying this valve. And so what you're going to see at the completion of that deployment is what we call parallax. And so we have a frame uh, basically reference that those diamonds are not completely superimposed upon one another. So there's some sort of misunderstanding or lack of understanding as to where the depth is in relation to not just the pigtail, but any uh, LVOT structure because the frame of the valve is not uniform. And so then because of that cognitive dissonance, we would then move to rotate the gantry to make those diamonds superimpose upon one another. But when we do that, we actually open up the lip of the native annulus and introduce parallax into the native annulus. So you're basically trading one form of error for another in this particular technique and view. Another interesting thing is that it's clearly demonstrated here and that's unique to this particular valve, how much of foreshortening occurs distally and not much at all uh, above, the, above the annulus. So you have to take that into consideration as well. Absolutely. Uh, which is another important factor. And so again, just showing you that whole concept of parallax in that valve frame. And, and, and as you click through this, it's going to be uncertainty as to what the true depth of implantation is. And to your point, if your pigtail is at the right coronary cusp, okay, you could probably ensure that your valve is not going to be deployed um, too low, and that's great. But you know, it's 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 really the higher deployments that matter. And so the pigtail, the base of the non-coronary cusp, is going to protect you from being too high. And so you want a shallow depth of deployment. It's better to have a pigtail at the base of a non-coronary cusp. If you, if you want to comment a little bit more on yep. a few of the things that they have here. We've got a front side of a cylinder, a back side of a cylinder, and they're not matching. They're not superimposed upon one another. So the whole purpose here is to show you that what this whole concept of parallax leads you to do is want to superimpose it so you find some sort of two-dimensional structure, which is fine. But the problem is that whatever you're doing to remove parallax out of that valve frame, you're doing the exact same thing to put parallax into the native annulus. And so by virtue of doing that, you're just going to be very confused with where exactly you deployed this valve. So it's pretty standard for the operators that uh, use Sapien that you always place a pigtail in the right coronary cusp, hoping that you will address and resolve this issue, but you're not really resolving it. Correct. And as you click through here, you're going to see that, I mean, you, you just are confused with where exactly you deployed this valve. So here is the view that we're going to use. And this is our cusp overlap view. So the non-coronary cusp isolation, left-right overlap. And this is typically going to shift you in an areocaudal gantry direction. Some people refer to this as areo cusp overlap or areo technique. The vast majority of the time, you will be in an areocaudal quadrant, but that's not definite. That's not 100%. And so as we reconstruct the CT scan, we're really going to pay attention to superimposing those right and left cusps, leaving the non-independent. And that'll most often be an areocaudal view, but you could have an AP caudal, aleocaudal, straight AP view, depending on the aortic and ventricular anatomy relating to one another. How you get here is not rocket science. We're basically doing a traditional coplanar view, and then we're just migrating down the S-curve to overlap those two dots, leaving the non-coronary cusp independent. How reliable is pre-procedural CT evaluation in predicting those angles? And how I often do you have to CT modify is my, I use my CT as my crutch. So, you know, I mean, I always tell my CT techs to let me know if the patient is unable to lie flat in the CT scanner, 
if they have to rotate them in any way, that sort of thing. I want to know details about that because basically the patient's going to be lying flat on the table during the procedure. That's the one thing where your pre-procedural CT, assuming it's good quality, may not predict exactly what happens during the case if your patient is in a different position between those two things. So here we see what happens when you start taking parallax out of things, okay? Typically when you do that, you're shifting the gantry LAO and then you're fiddling around with cranial caudal and you're typically ending up somewhere in an LAO caudal quadrant. What we know is when you do that, you rotate around the insertion of the left coronary cusp. You raise the right, you drop the non, and the non-coronary cusp, because it has parallax now in that annulus, it is no longer representative of whatever flor fluoroscopy you're viewing here of the annular plane. And in fact, what you're gonna end up doing is underestimating your depth of deployment. And so if you end up in this quadrant at the end of the procedure, simply by taking parallax out of things, you're going to underestimate your depth of deployment on the non-coronary side, as you see here. What about the scenario where you have either severe calcifications or for one reason or the other, morbid obesity or lung disease or uncooperative patient, you cannot clearly see the cusp to achieve whatever you wanted to achieve. How so in those, in, in those particular, and I would say it happens a vast minority of the time, obviously. So we're talking about something that may happen between 10 to 15% of occasion. The morbid obesity thing is very real. And uh, the reason why that's important is because some of these gantry angles are predicted as very steep. And so say you have a predicted cusp overlap view of REO 30, caudal 50, you have a large image intensifier, a morbidly obese patient, you're not going to be able to get there. So in those particular settings, we use what's called near overlap. And so we migrate back up the S-curve to perform a view that's actually realistic in the lab of attaining. We're not going to have pure isolation of the non-coronary cusp, but it'll be close enough to give you a relative good marker of where you're landing the valve in relation to the conduction system. Those kind of adjustments are necessary, like I said, 10 to 15% of time in our, in our experience. It's not something that uh, most of your cases are going to be just fine with that cusp overlap view going in and deploying the valve uh, as is. Very good. <clears throat> so can you guide us uh, in a step-by-step -step, uh, fashion as far as the implantation technique is concerned to avoid uh, <clears throat> the complications uh, as far as conduction disturbances are concerned? So to put it in text, I mean, this is basically what we're doing. We're overlapping the right and left coronary cusps, leaving the non-independent. That's most often in an REO or AP caudal view. The other thing about this view, and we didn't talk about this, but when you have a wire in the ventricle that's of suitable stiffness, and we tend to use the double curve Lunderquist wire in the vast majority of our cases, if we can take a pigtail and launch it into the apex, then that patient is gonna get a double curve Lunderquist. And so we unsheath the double curve Lunderquist in the apex. We don't manipulate that wire in any way, shape or form. It basically is unsheathed like you would a PFO or an ASD occluder device when you deploy that. And so basically it's a set it and forget it type of wire. I always deploy it through a pigtail. I don't pre-shape the wire in any way, shape or form. I let the Lunderquist do its thing. What that does is it stands the valve upright along the posterior aspect of the annulus. And so basically the wire then wedges into the non-right commissure. And that actually is gonna take parallax out of the ring of the delivery catheter of the evolute. So if you've got a good cusp overlap view and you're coming down with that marker band, expect parallax to be removed simply because of where the wire is positioned. And so that I think is an important facet of this technique that is gonna to lead to a more efficient and predictable procedure. The thing that we know about cusp overlap is when you overlap the left and right coronary cusps, there will be certain anatomies where you capture the right coronary cusp and miss the left coronary cusp. So there is on purpose a second view that we use where we basically pivot around the left coronary cusp, separating out the left and the right and seeing and making sure that we've caught the valve where we want to on that left coronary cusp side. But keep in mind, as I, as I kind of referenced in a previous slide, you don't want to look at the depth in relation to the non coronary cusp in that view, because odds are you're going to appear to be much shallower than you actually are in that specific view. When we reconstruct the CT scan, we're bisecting each coronary cusp and we're going to the true insertion of each cusp. And so you can see here that we're gonna be rotating around the annular plane and basically bisecting the leaflet straight in the middle. 
and we're gonna go down to the true insertions of each of these cusps. This is a whole 30 to 45 second process on 3Mencio, but it's invaluable because if you got a good quality CT scan and you're able to do this correctly, it's gonna save you a lot of time during the procedure. You're gonna march in with that one view and you're gonna be able to go to the point of no recapture with your Evolute valve uh, with confidence and understanding where you're deploying this thing in relation to the non coronary cusp insertion and the non recommissure. So what this is gonna walk through basically is the full reconstruction. So we have a traditional coplanar view. We rotate down the gantry to an ario caudal position here. This is an ario 15 or ario 13 caudal 25. And what we're gonna do here is basically simulate what this valve is going to look like in an LAO projection. Because again, the second part of that technique, when I rotate the gantry LAO, I kind of want to understand how shallow I'm going to look on that non-coronary side. And you can see here, as I rotate around the left coronary cusp, which would remove parallax from the valve platform, I get a decent assessment of where I am in relation to the left coronary cusp, which is grossly representing the annular plane. The non-coronary cusp pigtail slips below that line. And so you can see here that we're going to imbue an error in this particular example of somewhere around four millimeters. The vast majority of our cases, we're going to appear to be shallower than what is really happening on that non coronary side in the LAO view. So let's start uh, with uh, how you start the procedure. So it's not just about imaging. There are procedural modifications here. And so one of the procedural modifications that we do basically is start higher. And so instead of taking that marker band all the way down to the level of the annular plane and flowering out the valve, and pushing on the wire, which you don't need to push on a double curve Lunderquist again, but then pulling back on a delivery catheter, creating more of an inner curvature trajectory, and maybe even scraping the muscular septum as you do that, you're going to impair conduction. And so this is really a top-down deployment. We start with that marker band right around mid pigtail, and we're going to basically eject the valve down more ventricularly, as you'll see on the next slide. And so here we're slowly rotating the handle on the delivery catheter and the valve will naturally start its trajectory down towards the ventricle. The reason why this works is because you have a centimeter of space between the nose cone and the valve that's housed in this delivery catheter, this capsule. And that capsule is pinning back the non-coronary leaflet quite well. And so if you've got a stiff wire in the non right commissure, you got this capsule, you got five millimeters of it below the ventricular plane, the annular plane, that's fine. You don't need more than that. And so in most of your 29s and 34s, what you'll find is that even position one doesn't even need to exert tension forward. The valve is naturally going to dive down into the ventricle. Whereas some of your more calcified 23s and 26s, you may need to lean a little forward in order to get the valve to flower down. But we're aiming for a target implantation depth of somewhere around three millimeters below that non coronary cusp pigtail. So uh, <clears throat> tell us about pacing consideration during the deployment. Uh, what is your approach? So I love pacing, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the things about Evolute is that you don't necessarily need to pace, but just because you don't need to do something doesn't mean that it's advantageous to do it the majority of the time. And so with Evolute, I think the majority of the time, rapid pacing works quite well. And so once I'm up to about the third or fourth node with that marker band and the valve is starting to flower out and I've opposed that non-coronary side, I want to create a very efficient procedure. And so if I've got a normal ventricle and a patient that can tolerate it, just like they could a sapient pacing run, I dial the pacemaker right up to 180 and I go right up to the point of no recapture. When I get up to the point of no recapture, it's important that you dial down the pacemaker, not just abruptly shut it off. Because if you have a lack of calcium on the anatomy, um, you know, an unstable prosthesis, you can just eject the valve out uh, aortic. And with the Evolute, that's fine. I mean, you just recapture and start all over again. But again, to create a more efficient procedure, avoid those extra systoles, you wanna dial down the pacemaker pretty quickly. So to go from a rate of 180 to 80 in like 40 beats per minute increments, you can do that over a five, 10 second period of time and really avoid those extra systoles. Uh, in patients that can't tolerate it, then clearly I don't do it. So yeah, you can look at those patients who have poor ejection fractions, bad pulmonary hypertension, critical coronary disease, they're hypotensive, they're taking care of the problem for you and so you don't need to pace those people at a high rate. And so in those patients, just to eliminate ectopy, you can pace them at 100 or 120, and that'll be perfectly fine. But like I said, in the vast majority of my patients, for an efficient and predictable procedure, I get up to the point of no recapture with rapid pacing. Very good. So uh, how do you uh, confirm the depth 
and performance. Uh, at what point do you make that decision? You're satisfied or you're not satisfied? I need to recapture and so on. So in the cusp overlap view, what's shown on the left panel there is that's the view that we were using to deploy the valve in. And so we basically get up to the point of no recapture, we dial down the pacemaker, shut it off. And now we are looking at what I would call the left line or silhouette of the valve. Keep in mind that you will have parallax in the valve frame while you're attached to those tabs on the delivery catheter. It's important not to remove that parallax because if you twist away and remove parallax, you're going to, again, put parallax into the native annulus and you're basically going to be assuming the same problem that you're hoping to eradicate. And so here we're just looking at the depth in relation to the left line of the valve. The right view is the LAO view where we're rotating basically around the left coronary cusp insertion. I think the quickest way of doing this is just to open up the aortic arch by rotating LAO off of your cusp overlap view. So if your cusp overlap view is say an RAO 20, caudal 25, I would keep the caudal 25 on and just rotate to about an LAO 25 to open up the arch. When you do that, you rotate around the left coronary cusp insertion. You basically are going to separate out the left cusp from the right cusp. And so you'll get a very good understanding of where you've landed on the left side. Now, again, keep in mind in that LAO view that you're going to look super shallow on that non-cornery cusp, but understand that that's not reality. You're not super shallow. It's just because of the view that you've chosen to assess the left cusp. Very interesting. So one thing that's important uh, that I have seen uh, a lot of operators while they're deploying the device, this particular one, uh, evolute uh, that they rush through it and uh, they don't spend time uh, the recommendations are that you should wait for about 10 minutes for maximum expansion because if you don't you could have all kind of issues whether it's uh, ai because the valve didn't expand adequately or uh, or several other uh, problems so uh, <clears throat> yeah it's it's important to do all those things to make sure that everything is fine uh, what's interesting, whenever you go to the LAO and you look at the valve, you see that it's deeper than in the non-coronary cusp area. And uh, so the question is, when you see this, and here you can see that the difference could be, let's say, you have about two millimeters of a non-coronary cusp, and you probably have around five or six millimeters uh, on the left coronary cusp. What is what is your decision? When are you satisfied? When are you not satisfied? When are you going to reca sure. recapture? That's a very good question. And I think that for me, a differential of three millimeters is not a problem. I mean, the valve is naturally going to correct itself. Now, I want to make sure that I'm as shallow as I want to be on that non-coronary side because I'm a little deeper on the left and I'm very oversized with the prosthesis. I can expect that valve to right itself by shifting down more ventricular on that non-coronary side. And so it's important for me to really understand what I'm doing with that platform. So if I've got a six millimeter depth on the left and I'm like a three or a four on the non, I'm totally recapturing that valve. I'm going to pick it up a couple of millimeters, assuming that that cant is going to play a role. And so, yeah, this is the finesse that's possible because you understand in this technique where you're actually landing on that non-coronary side. Now, another pertinent uh, question is uh, a lot of operators that feel somewhat uncomfortable in aggressive placement of the valve very high, let's say a millimeter or two in certain scenarios, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they feel that it's risky. Now, what is your point of view for those that believe in this particular problem? So I, I will say that, you know, people kind of uh, misinterpret what we're presenting right now in that I'm not telling people to deploy a valve at zero. I'm basically telling you to deploy a valve at three, just like you've been comfortable doing, but actually understanding that you're deploying the valve at three and actually deploying it there versus thinking that you're deploying it at three and actually deploying it much deeper than that. And so that's really the hallmark of this technique. It's just to give you a more accurate assessment of your depth of deployment on the non-coronary side. Another question is, uh, do you use the same approach and the same strategy as far as depth of deployment in uh, all the scenarios, let's say I'll give you a few scenarios. A patient with complete heart block and a permanent pacemaker. Would you be aggressive or would you use a more uh, conservative approach in this particular So I like, I like the, the wrap of the Evolute Pro to interdigitate with as much leaflet anatomy as I can get it to. Um, basically, what's going to shut down the paravalvular leak from Evolute Pro platform is 
the fact that you've encompassed that surface area of the wrap and basically surrounded off all those micro channels that would happen with leaflets. And so actually a shallower implantation, I believe, and there's more data to be um, basically studied for this, that a shallower implantation is actually paradoxically almost going to lead you to have less leak and, and, and obviously improve your hemodynamic performance. But in, in any case, I'm basically going with the same mantra. I'm aiming for about a three millimeter depth of implantation. And the real reason for doing that is, is the fact that that pro wrap is going to interdigitate itself better with the leaflet anatomy. If you dip it too down, far down in the left ventricular outflow tract, it's not going to be doing anything for you. Very good. Now, the final step is releasing the valve. And maybe you can give you important details. What do you do at that particular time? So we were very quick to get to this point of the procedure and we did our assessments. Now we slow everything down. So the wire is pulled back. So it's barely out of the nose cone. And we're basically doing a 15 degree turn on the delivery catheter every 10 to 15 seconds. And we're just allowing the valve to expand in that annular plane to abut the calcified tissue for the night and all to warm up all of those things that will keep the valve nice and stable. We've made a decision as to whether or not position one is going to be leaning in on the delivery catheter or holding steady. In the LAO view, it's apparent what the lie of the delivery catheter is. And so if you're very outer curvature with your delivery catheter and you're deploying very shallow to the left coronary cusp, position one may not need to do anything at all. They may just hold on to the delivery catheter and that's about it. Whereas if you're more inner curvature and you're very shallow on the non-coronary side in your cusp overlap view, then maybe position one's going to push a little bit forward in order to stabilize the valve on that non-coronary insertion. But the key thing here is to be very methodical about the release of the valve and really allowing no fewer than 30 seconds to elapse while you're deploying the tabs of this valve. And so it's not just one motion and you're done because that's gonna lead to unintended migration. You're just serially, just serially dialing this thing, waiting for those tabs to release one at a time. Some people like to pace during this portion of the procedure. Um, you'll see that here. This is my colleague and friend, James Harvey, who did a procedure with cusp overlap. He likes to pace during the release of the tabs. I personally do a lot of LV wire pacing. And so in that particular circumstance, my wire is pulled back, so it's not going to be conducting. I just go very slow. So again, 30 second minimum to release the tabs. So why would you pace in this type of a scenario? What to eliminate act to be, to eliminate act to be, to stabilize blood pressure. People like doing that sort of thing. Hmm. Interesting. Now you didn't mention that you do uh, like uh, pacing, wire pacing. So uh, you feel like this saves you time and uh, no need for a pacemaker and stuff like this. Yeah, and potential pacemaker. morbidity. I think, and and I mean, it, there's there's been a nice analysis that was recently published on LV wire pacing. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's safe. Uh, you obviously avoid the morbidity of putting in a temp wire. Um, I think it's very reliable, um, as that study would have shown. But also in our experience, I mean, the LV wire pacing works really well, especially with the Lunderquist wire. And um, basically, we have two alligator clips. We have a cathode. We have an anode. The anode is basically clipped into the sheath insertion site. So one alligator clip basically on the sub-Q, one is on top of the skin. And then the other one is on the wire as it exits out of the delivery catheter. That'll be sufficient insulation for the circuit. Double curve Lundquist, you know, uh, basically melds very well with the ventricular myocardium. And so you're going to conduct pretty well. And, you know, say you do have a conduction disturbance, you know, just don't pull back the delivery catheter, leave it there, have the wire there. And if you've got venous access, you can put a temp wire in and then switch off your pacing circuit quite easily. But, you know, because our pacemaker rate is so low, um, most of the time LV wire pacing is kind of our go-to. Here we have a recapture. And so basically if you've got a valve that's deployed too deep to the point that we were making earlier, I like to pace during my recaptures as well. Using LV wire pacing, you don't really just completely stunt um, ventricular performance. And so the valve will actually naturally migrate itself up as you collapse it down to about the third node. And then we go right back up to the point of no recapture. And so you'll watch that again. Basically we're pacing down to about the third or fourth node of the valve and the valve just naturally migrates itself up with the LV pacing. And then we just go right back up to the point of no recapture. Uh, if you're super annular uh, with the valve platform, the base of the valve platform, then clearly you wanna do a full recapture and start all over again. And uh, the previous instructions for use are really what is applicable with how many times you can do a partial to full before they advise you to take a valve, the valve out and prep a new one. Very good. So, uh, <clears throat> uh... Now, 
what we have discussed so far predominantly is on self-expanding valves. Is this also applicable for the balloon expandable valves? Yeah, I really like using this technique, same technique for the balloon expandable valves. Now, a recent publication from Cleveland Clinic on the high deployment technique that they use, which is basically an areocaudal uh, gantry angle with parallax taken out of the valve. We go to a true cusp overlap view. So we're, we're actually very respectful of the native anatomy. I think going to an arbitrary areocaudal view doesn't really serve the purpose that you're seeking here. You want to be able to deploy a valve relative to the, the true insertion of the non coronary cusp in the conduction system. And so we use the same knowledge off the CAT scan that we use to plan our Evolute procedure. We do the same thing for the sapient deployment. And so the nuances here are that you've got a pigtail at the base of the non coronary cusp in the cusp overlap view. We position that middle marker basically just around mid pigtail and the radiolucent line of the valve just below that pigtail catheter. And that usually will lead to a 70, 30, 80, 20 style deployment. But again, to your point, that foreshortening can be unpredictable depending on how oversized you are, depending on how calcified the anatomy is, what uh, any kind of cant on the valve itself, uh, all of those things matter. And so it's not as predictable, I would say, as the Evolute cusp overlap implantation, simply because of the foreshortening, but this will get you reliably shallow implantation depths, I think, using this technique. It's interesting that uh, with uh, Sapien, this is uh, relatively rarely used uh, as far as I am aware. And a lot of operators that use almost exclusively Sapiens don't, don't do it uh, often enough. But uh, it's the other thing I'll point to. Show. Yeah. Yeah. The other that, thing I'll point they, to is look at the parallax in the valve frame once it's deployed in cusp overlap. Assuming you don't have much commissural calcium and you've got the right wire in place, look at how beautiful that valve looks. I mean, basically the parallax is entirely removed out of the valve platform. Right. So uh, there are uh, certain questions that are always very pertinent related to it. And uh, uh, some of them are how often or do you get pop outs and what do you do when you, do, yeah. when you have this? I think that that surrounds the point that you were bringing up with, you know, what about these shallow, super shallow deployments? And again, that's not what we're aiming for here. So our use of a second valve, Medtronic had to actually vet our data. And commercially, our use of a second valve is somewhere around one in 200. And it's usually because of something that has nothing to do with a pop out per se. That usually has to do with the fact that we've got like a degenerated homograft and we're putting one valve in as a scaffold to support the second deployment. Uh, we have a non-IFU case with a perimeter of 101, 102. We put two 34s in for radial force purposes. All of those things kind of lead to different cases where we could use a second valve. That's not really a pop out. But the whole point here is to understand your depth of implantation on that non-cornering side. So again, I'll say the purpose of the implantation technique is to tell you something on the screen that you can believe. And so you can believe a three millimeter implantation depth on cusp overlap fluoroscopically, whereas in another view, you're not gonna understand what your true depth of implant is. So uh, I have personally never experienced that, but I have seen many scenarios where this happened and almost invariably uh, <clears throat> this is related to either uh, some judgment error uh, as far as sizing is concerned. I've seen that in bicuspid valves or patients that have primary aortic insufficiency and not uh, really uh, calcium at all at the annulus or PVCs uh, or where you didn't lower the pressure enough and all of a sudden you lose control of it. So uh, another scenario which uh, I see that you can um, prevent this is using a stiff enough wire that supports you and you have a control. And this is where Lundquist plays a significant role. So uh, I think those things should be taken into consideration to avoid this type of a problem. And I think here this gets again at the depth of implantation. If you're going to post dilate, really just aim for a three millimeter depth of implantation. Right. So uh, post, post dilatation, it's another potential risk that you might dislodge the valve and you might get a pop out in addition to some other issues that might occur. But uh, so I, I am not very uh, enthusiastic in post dilatation unless I have some significant issues to deal with either perivalvular leak that's not resolving. That's why I like to wait for at least 10 minutes or so 
uh, or, or the issues where there is a significant gradient, particularly in scenarios where you deal with valve in valve type of issues. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, I would agree with you. I think that our post dilation rate is somewhere around 20% of cases. And that's usually because it's an insanely calcified, you know, anatomy where we've already pre dilated and then we have to touch it up with a post dilation as well. Uh, but that happens, like I said, the minority of the time. So I know uh, that you are a proponent of pre dilating before actually placing the valve. And can you mention what is your reasoning? Because a lot of operators don't do that. Yeah. And uh, there might be some prudence in your approach, and maybe you can discuss this. So I don't predilate uniformly. I would say it's probably about 50% of cases. And the 50% of cases that get predilated are based on calcium scoring that I do of the leaflet anatomy. And so there's a tool on 3Mencio that allows you to calcium score. And I'm not looking at an absolute number. Yeah. I mean, if I get like a really large, a uh, Hounsfield unit score, if the, the sample volume is like 2000 millimeters cubed, as far as the calcium is concerned, then yeah, I'm probably going to predilate that thing. But what I'm looking at is basically a distribution of calcium as it would relate to the commissures, as it would relate to the leaflet insertions, and then also the left cornering cusp matters, like we talked about earlier. And so all of those things, at least visually, I can see what type of calcium burden I'm dealing with, and then make the educated assessment as to whether or not a predilation would be necessary in that patient. And with self-expanding platforms, yeah, somewhere around 50%, I think, is a reasonable pre-dilation rate. And maybe a little bit more common in bicuspid scenarios. Right? Sure, absolutely. In fact, we, we uniformly pre-dilate all of our bicuspid valves. Right. What, what about uh, uh, the scenario where you uh, have a concern that uh, the valve is not going to expand adequately? You would take that into consideration as an important factor, right? No doubt. And I think that also relates to the calcium burden and the, and the location of it in, in kind of adjudicating predilation. Okay. So the last uh, frequently asked question, does this work for uh, Tavern and Saver? Yes, it works really well. We call it post overlap. And so you're basically overlapping two stent posts, leaving one independent. It's going to be an areocaudal or aleocranial view to choose from. I would just pick the one that is easiest and uh, deploy just like you would in native cusp overlap. It works very well. Can you uh, mention also some other useful technical tips as far as wire choices and rapid pacing is concerned? So like we talked about, the double curve Lunderquist wire, I mean, this is something that I really would harp on as being a critical part of this particular procedure and leading to the most symmetric implantations, especially with your larger size valves like a 34 millimeter core valve XL, you really want that stability of the Lenderquist wire. And so I can't mention the attributes of it enough. And I know that people, you know, historically like kind of shun when they hear the word Lenderquist, but this is a wire that can be managed quite well and quite appropriately. Just like all things, you have to have respect for it and you have to deploy it the right way. Use a pigtail catheter, be knowledgeable about your native anatomy and don't push forward on the wire at any point during the procedure. Rapid pacing, we talked about this. Basically, I like to do it in the majority of my cases. But again, I understand the clinical situation I'm dealing with with that patient. And that's going to modify whether or not rapid pacing is appropriate for a given patient. In general, I say pace at the rate that works for you. But in order to create a predictable and efficient procedure, definitely consider pacing at a higher rate. And then finally, it's all a recipe. There's nothing arbitrary about this, as I hope we've been able to discuss during the length of this presentation. I would use all of it, the imaging reconstruction, the Gantt review, the procedural steps, the technical features and nuances. I think that's how you get these outcomes of single digit pacemaker rates. Very good. So let's summarize all the important information that uh, we have discussed uh, during this presentation. So really we want best in class permanent pacemaker rates across the board, but in the low risk population, this is especially pertinent. Uh, these are people that are going to be living longer periods of time. They're more functional. Pacemakers can be more deleterious in that particular population. So understanding how to deploy this valve is so key, Evolute and Sapien. And so we can predict the optimal gantry angle for tower deployment quite easily on CTA reconstruction, as we pointed out. Keep in mind this whole concept of parallax and how important it is to understand its influence on your procedure. 
And so these are all three dimensional structures. When you arbitrarily rotate the gantry, you're going to shift the relationship in a way that maybe you can't even cognitively ascertain. So it's important to understand the anatomy up front on that CAT scan and use a predictive gantry view to go in the case and make it efficient and predictable. And then finally, keep in mind that if you do these proper implantation steps and you are going to be very knowledgeable about the anatomy, then you're likely going to get best in class prone and pacemaker rates. And, and really what you should understand is that you don't wanna just arbitrarily take parallax out of things during the procedure. When you use cusp overlap, you're really sticking in one view for the majority of your deployment. And I think you'll find that to be a very simple, effective and efficient way of doing the procedure. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Gada, you are a true pioneer as far as uh, Dabur is concerned in advancing the new techniques and technology and you're bringing science into this procedure that a lot of people think it's pretty straightforward and simple. And it's actually not simple uh, when you look at all the potential variables that can affect the outcome of the procedure, particularly as far as uh, uh, conduction disturbances are concerned and the incidence of complete heart block. And this was one of the major problems and issues with uh, TAVR, particularly in early stages when we're talking about 30 plus percent need for permanent pacemaker. And you have reduced this to dramatically to uh, between three to 5%. And uh, that certainly uh, has uh, offered many, many operators uh, to have good results and uh, for patients uh, to have a good procedure and uh, lower risk, uh, particularly related to the conduction uh, disturbances. So we are greatly appreciative uh, for the opportunity to have you in this uh, program, and thank you very much for sharing this information with us. Thank you, it was an absolute pleasure.